Uh, my name is Ari Matusiak. I'm the CEO of Rewiring America. We're a nonprofit organization committed to electrifying everything in the economy as the way forward on climate, and frankly, as the way forward to um, address climate via American households and families helping them save money and increase their quality of life and their health outcomes while we work on bending the curve on the, on temperature increases um, in the planet. You said um, a word that I hadn't considered, which was electrifying everything. So I, I know that the home is is a big part of it. What? How big is, everything's a pretty all encompassing word, but what's in the everything we may not be considering? Sure. Um, you know, climate is kind of a overwhelming topic and feels a little bit distant from people, uh, for people, because you know, we're talking about um, how we're talking about climate change on a planetary scale. How can I possibly have an impact on that? Um, when you start to break down the problem, you learn interesting things. It turns out that 90% of the emissions in the United States, as a for instance, comes from our generation and consumption of energy. Yeah. And that kind of makes sense. There's uh, there are emissions from um, cows. We can't electrify the cows, uh, but um, but for the most part, it comes from the energy that we source, that we refine, and we transmit to the machines that we ultimately use to power our industry, to power our businesses, to power our homes and our lives. So that's ninety percent of the emissions is from that whole energy life cycle. It turns out that 42% of those emissions come from decisions that we make at our kitchen tables. What kind of cars we drive, how we heat our air, how we heat our water, how we cook our food, how we dry our clothes. 42% is a huge number. Um, and uh, that's distributed basically across 121 million households. And by our count, roughly a billion machines that exist in those homes that either need to be replaced or installed with efficient electric uh, equipment. So that's sort of the, the, the upshot of what we're talking about. And I can just say a sentence more about it, which is that, so let's take that 42%. That's a big part of the way we need, big part of, the, um, of where we need to go. And we don't need to wait for any miracle of moonshot technology. And we're, we don't need to ask folks to mm. dramatically change their lives or sacrifice. The machines that we need to electrify our households, to electrify our businesses and schools, to electrify the whole economy, they already exist. Um, what we really need to do is just make sure that they're affordable for folks so that that clean electric machine is the most um, is the cheapest and most convenient one for them to, to purchase when the time comes. It, staying on that for a second, it feels like, um, to your point, that following this path of electrification, you know, starting in the driveway with the car all the way into the house, it feels pretty expensive for most folks. What is, and I, and I know that the time horizon you know, General Motors is going to stop making, you know, um, internal combustion engines going to go electric. That's it. So things are moving very fast. But the economy around these machines that are in our homes, which which you talk a lot about, um, how quickly are they going to change where it can become affordable for most people? Sure. Um, it's important to distinguish between the front end cost and the operating cost, right? So, um, so for um, when we're talking about these machines, the car, cars are a great starting point because people have um, familiarity with EVs and, and sort of the, the growth in EV adoption and what you just said about car companies making the switch entirely if they produce fossil fuel, uh, internal combustion engine cars. What's happened over the last several years is that you've seen the costs of the raw material that go into the EVs come down quite a bit. And by 2025 or so in the United States, the cost of an electric car will be cheaper off the dealer a lot than an internal combustion engine counterpart. And that's without the rebates or the tax incentives or any of that. It's just that the machine itself will be cheaper to manufacture, produce and sell 
than the internal combustion engine alternative. And if you think about it, it makes sense because electric cars are a lot simpler than internal combustion engine mm. cars. There's a motor and a battery and some wheels and a, and, a, and a couple of pedals and a steering wheel. Internal combustion engine cars have all kinds of other stuff that, it's, that, are, that are inside of them. It's just that we've gotten to a level of industrial scale where we've been able to figure out how to manufacture them relatively um, efficiently economically. Well, that same kind of analogy between the cost curves and the simplicity of the electric car as compared to the internal combustion engine car is true for all the machines in your basement or in your garage or in the side of your house. Um, the electric machines are simpler. They are uh, ultimately, um, they ultimately will be cheaper as soon as we get to the level of industrial scale that we need where enough of them are being manufactured. Um, so this is, really a, this is really a question of scale, first and foremost. But the great news about, about, the, about these machines is that for 103 million households or more today out of 121 million households, the cost of running those machines is cheaper than the fossil fuel equivalent that mm. they would replace. So said simply, people's energy bills will come down with these electric machines today. We have to solve the delta on the front end for the, for the cost while the industry scales up and they ultimately get to the same kind of price point as the machines that uh, exist on the market today. And, and the other thing to just note about this is we're not talking about, um, I've yet to meet somebody who says, boy, you know, I can't wait till the new water heater model comes out because I'm totally upgrading. <laughs> we were right? just this talking is, about that. Right. This is just about when something breaks, you replace it. We're talking about um, the kinds of appliances that people depend on, but don't think about while they're working. So... I find that to be very liberating, actually, because while it's a huge number of machines that need to be installed and replaced over the over the course of the next couple of decades, it's really next water heater up. You know, it breaks, it should get replaced with an efficient electric one. And that's a purchase that a household is going to be making at the time yeah. as they're not going to go without a water heater. So that's the transition that we're talking about. I've got to feel like there's uh, there's that one sense that you you hit us with right at the bat, which was the the problem you said planetary scale. That's that that's big. That's an important word, um, and that as a in, single individual, it's hard to do. How do I? How am I making a difference? I'm recycling. I'm do. I'm mean, doing all the right things, but how how do I? And I think there's a a level of frustration. Do you feel that there's a a basic misunderstanding that maybe we could clear up about that to how people collectively really do make a difference? Sure. I, I think um, to be, to speak plainly, we need to have excellent policy and political um, will to address the climate crisis, right? We're not, um, we're not going to be able to do this each on our own. Right? And so that's where the planetary scale um, feels overwhelming because what kind of agency do you or I or any single person have over what we see on the news about what's going on in Washington? It's hard to kind of fathom how you would be able to control that or really affect that. Um, and um, I think it's hard to fathom even for some people who are in Washington how to control or affect that. So that's... So it's a, it feels very far away and not at all relatable to people's lives. Um, but it turns out that our carbon footprint individually or as families or as households really, really redound to the, the kitchen table decisions that we make that I mentioned earlier. And so much of um, the carbon footprint that we're associated with personally mm -hmm. relates to the things that we care a lot about as families in terms of balancing our checkbooks each and every month. You know, do we have, um, uh, are we paying too much on energy bills? Are, th are there ways for us to save on our, on our cost of getting to work? 
Um, those are things that ha also have quite a lot to do with our, our carbon emissions that we each are associated to. And so we need to basically marry the two parts of this. Um, on the one hand, we need to make it easy for folks to purchase that clean, electric, efficient machine. That has the biggest impact on whether uh, on somebody's um, on the emissions that we each individually control. But in order to make it easy for folks to do that, we need to have good policies in place, right? Because um, because it turns out that the planet also doesn't care um, whether the water heater is owned by a rich person or a poor person. It cares about the emissions that the water heater is making. And so we, we need to deal with all of them, not just some of them. One of the things I noticed in, in reading uh, on your site was how much attention you pay to policy. For, for normal folks who don't live in, in your world, um, how is it that an organization like yourself actually impacts policy decisions? Well, I, I think um, sometimes, sometimes it's easy to take for granted that the policy process is shaped and designed and ultimately decided by people. Mm -hmm. And people who are themselves um, learning new things each and every day if they're open to it. And so, I mean, part of what we've discovered is that there's a um, uh, there's a real power in just being able to explain what's going on, mm -hmm. and that there is a path forward that is attainable and practical and pragmatic. Um, that again doesn't rely on moonshot technologies that we don't have yet today, and that isn't asking people to sacrifice or um, give up stuff in their lives. And so a part of um, our role really has been just telling the story about how um, this is ultimately a, um, a household and community solu based solution. The mm. answer is there. Um, and for politicians and policymakers, if they can do something for the planet, that's also good for their constituents. Uh, meaning to say that helps them save money on their bills or helps their kids be healthier because they're not burning fossil fuels in their kitchen. Um, those kinds of things uh, become win-win scenarios. And then you take it a step further and you just sort of think practically about the what the implications are, which is to say that if we're talking about um, installing and replacing a billion machines in the United States, those are jobs that can't be offshore or automated because you can't call somebody um, in a foreign country and have them pop on over to your house and install your furnace. But they're also an, it's an enormous economic opportunity for us to make manufacture and export goods that the rest of the world is going to need as well. So, so we've been able to tell that story a little bit and, um, and hopefully it has some impact in terms of how policymakers are thinking. Um, and then we back it up with the data. You know, we are, we are good at sort of understanding wh what is required and who will benefit from these, from these solutions. Ari, I was, um, I was impressed um, looking at your website and, and getting ready for this conversation. I'm a, a data-driven guy. Data-driven visualizations get me, and uh, the way you've integrated data and maps and then told a story so to help us understand what that is. I'm so glad you guys are working on this problem. I, my, my, uh, I'm, I will be radically optimistic with you. Good, good. We, we need everybody to be radically optimistic. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>